guys.
a very bad impression in my life. <laughs> that crew, they're all in the back there. All back there. All the leaders are in the back. That table right there. <laughs> if you talk about uh, going bad and people influencing your life, uh, that group, they've been around 70 years. They, hang, they hung out in the same corner for 70 years. They still go back and reminisce, and they'll be going back for another 70 years. However, I never got into this relationship with my brother. My brother is basically known as, uh, well, my mother had a great expression. She called my brother soft as off, which means uh, someone that hides things and uh, does things in a quiet manner. And uh, my brother basically gave me my first dollar, which I still have, uh, when I was about 14 years old. He worked very hard, very dead. Uh, the family had to bail him out a few times. He was uh, picked up by the cops three or four times. And uh, we took him out on probation. He's been on probation for a number of years. No one knows this. I don't think his wife knows it. I don't think his children know about it. Uh, there is really nothing good I can say about my brother. Am I ashamed? Well, let's put it this way. He reached 70 years, and uh, I guess this is the time when I have to say to him that I really love him. I appreciate all the things he did for me and for the family. He was one of the greatest guys. If anybody ever wishes for a brother, this is the guy you want for a brother. My brother, Frank. And the only good thing I can say about him, thank God, because he also brought a lot of women to our group. <laughs> Ray, I'm sorry, Ray, but that was before anything happened. But now that he's, that he's married and all the good children that's around him, I want to wish him, him and our friends that we lost, a Chendai. Happy birthday. So the first time I met Greg was 1976. I, uh, I said to him, I want to marry your daughter. I could tell that he was from the Bronx. Is anybody from the Bronx here? <laughs> hey, anyway. I knew he was from the Bronx. I said, I want to marry your daughter. He said, forget about it. <laughs> and during the next 20 years, I heard that phrase so many times. Greg, I need a mortgage for a new house. Forget about it. <laughs> Greg, I need college tuition. Forget about it. Over and over. 22 years I've heard that, right? <laughs> the best time of the year to be at the Pietrucola residence is Christmas time. As Bobby said, that's when Greg bakes, and he's a wonderful baker. So you walk in on a Sunday afternoon, the aromas are just wonderful. The only problem is when Greg bakes, you can't find a place to sit. There's no, because he's got snuffle on every couch. God forbid you should not feel well, you want to lie down, you can't lie down. There's ravioli on the bed. Forget it, you can't do it. Sunday afternoon in general is a one, but see, Greg's very romantic, you may not know this. But on Sundays, he and Ray, they have this kind of little sonata that they do. It's a little serenade back and forth. At like about one o'clock on a Sunday afternoon, you'll hear Ray, you'll hear Greg say to Ray, Put the butt on! You know, that's the point of the sonata. And Ray kind of chirps back to him. You're gonna cut the meat now or what? You know, and this thing going back and forth, it's, it's just wonderful. Besides Greg's smile, another thing I admire about Greg is his friends. They're all sitting back here. You see, in my generation, we have a friend for five minutes. My son's generation, a friend is a few minutes and they're gone. But Greg, his boyhood high school friend, they're here. These are lifelong friends. You gotta love them for that, right? And you gotta love their names. They all have these wonderful names. Right here you got Little Joe. Joe, raise your hand. Little Joe, right over there. Joe, stand up. Stand up for me. <laughs> Little Joe was the enforcer of 187th Street, right here. And you got Joe Diggs right next to him. Joe Diggs, stand up. And of course, Chris. Chris, right? And of course, who's not here is Tiny, who's huge, right? Lou Black who's not here, and my personal favorite, Nikki Dogs. <laughs> and Nikki Dogs, Nikki, Nikki was Dion DiMucci's 
uncle. Yeah. And I, want, I just want to take you back to what that must have been like the summer of 1947 on 187th Street. What was that like? Postmodern, post-war America, optimism, a lot of things to talk about, stimulation, a lot of grist, a lot of good conversation. It was before doo they weren't singing doo right? And just think of these guys on 187th Street talking with each other. What was it like? Maybe it was like, Joey, what do you want to do tonight? <laughs> I don't know. What do you want to do tonight? Well, why don't we go stand over there instead of over here? It must have been fantastic, right? And then I'm sure one of them probably said to Greg, hey, Greg, you, uh, you want to meet a girl? I got a nice girl for you. Yeah, who are you? Who, what's her name? Greg said, Raphael. And Greg said, forget about it. <laughs> But then that's how they met, and of course the rest is history, four wonderful children, and we know Greg's a terrific father, a little strict. Greg is a, well known to be a little strict, some would say just to the right of the tiller <laughs> a little, a little strict. But Greg was democratic, he always gave his kids choices, yeah, he would say, you got a choice, take it or leave it, that's your choice, right? He would say, my way or the highway. And his son Gregory, you know, he was always asking Greg, little Gregory from the time he was a kid, what do you want to be when you, when you grow up? What do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to be when you grow up? And Gregory would say to me, why does he keep asking me what I want to be when I grow up? I said, Greg, he's looking for ideas. <laughs> he, needs, he doesn't know what he wants to be when he grows up. And of course, um, as Bobby said, Greg, a crap mechanic. Uh, engines, train engines. Nobody can figure out how that train went from Woolwich to Garfield.